All right, friends, welcome to the Blessed Family Podcast. Uh, Very excited to be with you today. Uh, We are entering into my favorite time of the year, November and December. We have Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year, family gatherings, cold weather, uh, not freezing here in Texas, but cool enough, and uh, snuggling up by the fire, enjoying stories. It gets dark earlier. It just creates that family atmosphere. Very excited about. This is my favorite time of the year. I absolutely love it. Well, today, uh, this is episode 95. We're going to be asking the question, who are your children's teachers? And let's start by asking the question, why does it even matter? I mean, obviously, our children need teachers. Uh, Who are they? Everyone would agree it does matter. Teachers are important. But many people are trapped within a very modern, secular, which is a word that doesn't even exist really, but or a concept, but just an idea that confines teachers to simply schools or in the homeschool realm, maybe uh, parents, which is very important, don't get me wrong, uh, youth pastors maybe, great people like that. But friends, there are so many amazing teachers out there. And if you give your children the right teacher, uh, you will set them up for a immense success. Uh, Jesus spoke of a principle that I think is very important and very overlooked in Matthew chapter 10 when he said uh, when he said these words he said a disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master it is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master so in a way Christ right here gives us gives us this principle that whoever your teachers are place a ceiling above your head it can either be a ceiling that's low that you bounce your uh, you know, um, symbolic, you know, wisdom or knowledge upon, or it can be a ceiling as high as the sky where you're set up to soar. And that's why teachers are so important. It's very difficult for a student or a servant to rise above his teacher or master. It's, you know, it's enough. The goal is to just be like them. And so, and, 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 uh, so if you, if you give your children teachers that, just aren't aren't all that is available. I mean, and you know, this isn't to insult people, this isn't to tear people down, but there are there are good teachers, and so you can put a good ceiling there, but there are amazing teachers. There are teachers like no other. Obviously, Christ, we're going to talk about being the chief teacher, who raises that ceiling and gives your children an an an, an opportunity to grow. I mean, your children are 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 like olive shoots. And to, to have an olive shoot that has that has a little ceiling over it and it 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 uh, thwarts the growing of the plant. That's what we don't want. Now, as I said, ultimately the capital all cap teacher we want our children to follow is Christ, and this needs to be stressed. This needs to be taught. Uh, we need to, we need to tilt to to uh, sit down with our children and say, children, as parents, our job is to help you connect with your teacher, which is Christ. Our job is that you will follow your teacher, your rabbi, Christ, and the Spirit of Christ for the rest of your life and for all eternity. And that's important. That's very important. And 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 please don't make the mistake of assuming just because your children are brought up in a church or a Christian family that they've caught on to that idea. Many wonderful Christian parents, even wonderful Christian pastors, fail to understand that this is the mission of parents is to is to get our children to practically not just not just with lip service, say, yes, Christ is my teacher, but practically learn how to follow him as a disciple. So that is of of, uh, chief importance. Now, second to Christ, the Bible is very clear that parents are the next teachers in line. Humanly speaking, teachers are, I'm sorry, parents are the number one teachers. And scripture, of course, is very clear on this in Deuteronomy 6, 6, and 7. You know, as you walk along the way, sit down, lie down, stand up. You are to be doing life with your children and you are to be imparting these things upon their hearts, just not on Sundays or Wednesdays, just not on the weekends, but 24-7, right? Uh, Ephesians, Colossians speak of children training up, I'm sorry, parents training up their children in the way they should go. Uh, scripture, Proverbs 22, 6 speaks of training a child in the way he should go when he's old, he will not depart from it. And clearly in the context of Proverbs, that is speaking about parents discipling their children. And so, uh, I mean, friends, just that is a huge touchdown in today's society. Many children are raised not seeing their parents as shepherds and teachers and not seeing Christ as a teacher. And I'm not talking about the lost. It definitely includes them. I'm talking about Christian 
private, homeschooled, I mean, devout, kingdom, church-going families where the children do not regard mom and dad as teachers. Really, they don't. And this is because mom and dad don't sit down, open the Word of God, and teach. And so it's something we have to do, right? It's something that's caught just as much, if not more, than taught. Okay, now, who else? Okay, you have, you have Christ first. You have uh, parents. Who's next in line? Very important. Next in line is other family, uh, such as grandparents. Friends, if you are blessed, if your children are blessed with grandparents who love God, or even are just, you know, as, as far as the world standards go, good people who have skills that they can pass on, like canning or crafting or building or fishing, your children have a wonderful opportunity. And friends, this is where the world has conditioned us to outsource our children to the state. Bad idea. Parents, if you're doing that, do whatever it takes to get your children out of those government-run schools. They are not places that need to be reformed. They're places that need to be abandoned and defunded. Uh, and you, you can reach out to us if you need more explanation on that. Um, well, let me just say, those places are places of indoctrination. Uh, they cost a lot of money and ironically, very little true education, really, I mean, very little true education takes place. What takes place is a lot of indoctrination, bad companies that corrupt good morals, evolutionary Darwinian philosophies, Marxist philosophies, uh, critical race theory, gender confusion, Im, uh, immorality and darkness. It's a bad idea. And if you're listening to this, I think you get that. Um, but man, so the world has conditioned us to outsource our children to the government, the outsourcing we need to do should be few and little, but it needs to be strategic. For example, uh, I love when my parents, as grandparents, take my children under their wings and teach them things. And they go over to grandma and grandpa's and they have fun, but they also work and they learn and they bond. Or with their spiritual grandparents, like elders in our church, which actually, that's the next example, elders and shepherds in your church, uh, to go out with them and be discipled, to go out and fish. But while they're fishing, they're talking about life. I mean, see, that's what Christ did. Christ very rarely taught from a pulpit, if you will. He taught while fishing. He taught while walking. He talked while, or taught while harvesting, while ministering to people. And that's what we need to create those opportunities. And it's not just the elders and grandparents. Well, let's move on to elders. Not just elders and shepherds or pastors teaching um, in our homes, which are good, or while they're fishing, or while they're walking along the way, or while or while your teenage children are going over to help uh, because they because they have a newborn, your pastor's wife, and so they're going to do laundry and cook and clean and help. But also from the pulpit. You need to teach your children that, hey, when we gather on the Lord's Day and we listen to our leaders teach friends, or I'm sorry, children, also friends, uh, we need to do that with reverence, understanding this is how we grow. This is how we learn. Okay, next we have other men and women in the church which give skills and wisdom. So, so there's people. It's Christ, parents, and then people, family, grandparents, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, um, elders in the church. And then, and this is, this is really my favorite part. Uh, well, no, I'm sorry. I skipped a part. First of all, okay, so now we need to train our children. Okay, children, grandma and grandpa are going to reach out to you. Elders or this person or that person are going to reach out to you. What do we need to teach our children on how to engage and take advantage of these opportunities? Well, it's really simple yet powerful. You teach your children to ask questions. And friends, this is, this is a sign of wisdom. Jesus, when he was 12, the one story we have from his upbringing as a son under Joseph and Mary, he was gathering with wise, older people and he was asking questions, right? And so that's what we need to teach our children to do, to ask questions. Uh, and this is something that they need to be taught. They need to be conditioned and it becomes a habit, right? That when they're at the dinner table, they've learned to ask questions. So those questions, well, how much money did you make in your first job, Grandpa? Or they're talking to their elder. Uh, Sir, as I approach the age of marriage, what should I look for in a spouse? I mean, these are amazing skills and skill sets that are worth gold. They're more important than spelling. They're more, more important than trigonometry. Give them to your children. Those other things are also good, by the way. But pale in comparison. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so uh, you also teach your children to observe and pick up on traits, behaviors, and skills. Uh, you teach them to look at work ethics of men and women that they, that they uh, look up to. Uh, you teach them to look at the way that husbands treat wives and wives treat husbands. And you teach them to gain wisdom. Friends, this is something that, that children used to know how to do. And yet it is very absent today, but not with you. Teach it to your children. Okay, now we get to one of my favorite parts. What about teachers who are long gone? Friends, do you realize what God has provided for his church? Christ has provided an amazing list of teachers to choose from. I mean, so many teachers, you can't learn from all of them. And so this is where, you know, we have different interests. We have different theological ideas. And so we can pick and choose. There's, a, I mean, but hey, pick and choose well. Because your children are going to follow these teachers. When I, was, when, uh, when I first came to Christ at the age of about 15, 16, as I grew into a, to Christian maturity, Christian adulthood, some of my teachers who I never met were people like Dallas Willard, right? Ray Comfort, Paul Washer. Now, I actually got to have a conversation with uh, Dallas Willard. My friend Luke and I, we were pastoring a church up in Wisconsin. We had questions. We were reading. We were learning from this teacher, and we reached out to him, and we got to do a two-hour conference call with him, and it was amazing. It was beautiful. And we just came up with all these questions and we just asked question after question. And he patiently, lovingly, he's gone to be with the Lord now. He patiently, lovingly walked us through that. Um, I asked my son Isaiah this morning, Isaiah, list off five teachers that are long gone. And um, of course, this always drives my voice crazy because, you know, if you say, what are your five <laughs> favorite books? They can't answer. It just, it just causes so much good anxiety, I guess, if there is such a thing, because they're wrestling their hearts. Gosh, I don't want to betray this teacher or this book, and there's so many. But he rattled off uh, right away Calvin and Luther, which, goodness gracious, those are amazing uh, teachers. He listed Aquinas. And I said, okay, Isaiah, that's great. Give me some guys from more recent history. Those, those first three teachers are good, but can be pretty intimidating. Uh, and he said, okay, R.C. Sproul, and C.S. Lewis, R.C. Sproul and C.S. Lewis. This morning, actually, for our family devotion time, after we did the Bible and Aesop's Fables, uh, we went on to YouTube, which is dangerous and scary, but can have some good stuff on it. And we found a channel, well, it's a channel we've been subscribed with for a long time called C.S. Lewis Doodle. And it's this guy, kind of like the Bible Project, you hear C.S. Lewis teaching, and this man is doodling, and it's really, really good. Um, if someone came to me and said, Jared, give me one teacher from the 20th century to be a teacher to my family, I think C.S. Lewis might be it. Amazing thinker. And see, it's not that everything he said was right. That's, that that, that uh, title is reserved only for Christ. Everything Christ said is right. Everything the scripture says is right. And some of these teachers get, some, uh, get stuff wrong just like I'm going to and you will also. But as far as a man who, if... If I wanted my children to think a certain way, it would be like this man. He was a brilliant thinker. He knew how to think. Um, and, you know, that's where uh, we encourage his books, uh, like his uh, books just on how to think, like Mere Christianity or The Great Divorce, The Four Loves, um, and also his novels, uh, such as The Space Trilogy or The Dark Tower. But, you know, the teachers go on. Men like Wes Callahan, Doug Wilson, Abraham Kuyper, Milton Friedman. These are all authors and people that my, that my children have listened to or they've read. Uh, Washington, read Washington's 110 Rules for Reformers, which you can get on our website. My wife made a beautiful booklet of it, jared.com. Uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, Jared, uh, my son, last night was telling me how much he loves Churchill's volume on the history of English-speaking people. He says it's amazing. I haven't read it. So, so friends, there, there, there are so many amazing teachers. And do you understand what happens when your children listen to or watch or read these people? They're taking their mind and putting it in their own and, 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 and kind of infusing the two. And that's why you have to be very picky and very careful. But don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. None of these people outside of Christ were perfect. I mean, this is what Hebrews 11 shows us. Actually, this is a biblical principle. Hebrews 11 shows us 16 heroes many of who contributed writings, which were, were, of course, inspired by God in the scriptures. And uh, they weren't perfect. 
and yet they're called heroes and, and, you know, they are referred to as this great cloud of witnesses that we are to run alongside. And, um, and so don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. No one is perfect other than Christ. And yet there are a plethora, a long list, hundreds of wonderful men and women who weren't perfect and they made great errors, but we learn from those errors just as they did. And they wrote about the errors they did. And, and it's just an awesome opportunity. So scripture with that great cloud of witnesses encourages us to understand who has gone before us and learn from them. Friends, there is this attitude today, I think more than ever before, that everyone's an expert. Everyone's opinions matter. We are walking in Proverbs 8, uh, 18, 2, which says a fool takes no delight in understanding, but only in airing his own opinions. And it used to be that sons and daughters realized that they didn't have knowledge. They didn't have wisdom. Their opinions weren't worth really anything. And they needed, therefore, to sit at the feet of men and women of history. And men, of, and men and women in their home, like mom, dad, grandma, and grandpa, men and women from their local church and community. And that's the attitude that we need to give our children. Here's a fun exercise. Go on to AZ Quotes or other website like that and look at people that you think are worth admiring and listen to their quotes. I've got three. I just rattled off real quick. Uh, Reagan said this. He said the most terrifying words in the English language are, quote, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. We like Reagan. We think he has good things to say. Uh, Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt said this, a thorough knowledge of the Bible is worth more than a college education. I think that's something that parents need to hear today. And of course, Washington saying things like firearms stand next in importance to the constitution itself. So who are your children's teachers? Friends, here is the main point. You want to raise your children to realize that they need the wisdom of their forefathers. Once again, like I said, everyone thinks they're an expert. You don't want that in your children. I don't want it in mine. I want them to realize that even though they're great, we love them, we're fans of theirs. They don't have knowledge. They don't have wisdom. They don't yet know what they need to know. And the knowledge is out there. But usually the older, the better. If I can read a marriage book written in 2022 or a marriage book written like the one I have called uh, The Family, written by Miller in 1850s, I'm going to read Miller. Doesn't mean that if it's, if it's old, it's good. But usually it's better. Choose their teachers wisely. But hey, choose choose. Hurry up. Time's against us. Today is the day of salvation. It's time for our children and your children to be inspired from the huge reservoir of knowledge we have from the past. So friends, I hope this encourages you. I hope it challenges you. And I hope that you will sit down with your children and say, hey, you know what? Mom and dad just want to apologize and confess. We have really missed out on this opportunity. Children, there are so many amazing teachers here locally and also from the past, and we're going to connect with them so that you can learn from them. And so that that ceiling that Christ mentioned when he said a teacher, I'm sorry, a student cannot be above his teacher. It's just enough for him to be like them. We're going to raise that ceiling so that you won't hit your head on that ceiling, but that you'll soar to the glory of God. Friends, thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.